Hi everyone, it's Amy here from the blog I Think Therefore I Teach. Welcome to your next criminology video. This video is for Unit 2 and it is 4.1. Don't forget this is your assessment topic area so you will have this as part of your exam uh, in summer in your first year. Right, let's get going. All right, so assessment criteria 4.1, assess the use of the theories in, uh, assess the use of theory, sorry, in informing policy development. So what we will cover in this unit, we will look at the biological, individualistic and sociological policies um, linking to what we've done previously. So we will look within the biological policies, we'll look at biochemical, this is drugs and diet, we'll look at eugenics and the death penalty. Within individualistic policies, we'll look at psychoanalysis, we'll look at behaviourist, including operant conditioning and classical conditioning and aversion therapy and cognitive behavioural therapy or CBT. Finally, we'll look at sociological policies, so Merson strain theory, labelling theory and right realism including penal populism, prison and zero tolerance. So how this will work in your assessment is you could get a question that says um, um, assess uh, an individualistic policy, um, you know you, you might get short stories, um, discuss the different policies that could be used in this case, um, look at it from a sociological perspective. So that's sort of what, what the questions would be like in your assessment. Number one then, biological policies, the biochemical treatment. So these are drugs. So Ant abuse and, uh, is often given for alcoholism and uh, stilbestrol is something that is often used to uh, suppress the sex drive. So when we did this as a class, we discussed the issues of using them on criminals. Do you think that you should, for example, give criminals drugs such as those to suppress sex drive? Uh, um, do you think that you should give alcohols things to help with uh, drugs to help with things like alcoholism? So what are what are the strengths and weaknesses of giving drugs to criminals? For diet, we've got Gesh et al. who talks about diet rich in certain vitamins and fatty acids lowers antisocial behaviour. So again, as a class, we discussed any issues in changing the diet people convicted of offences. We looked at should their food be changed? Should they have more vi vitamins and fatty acids? So should they basically have better, better diet? What my class discussed was if the prisoners were fed better, that might mean that they were... Um, less aggressive because obviously if you're hungry you get more aggressive so if they had more satisfying food but then what happens when they're out of prison they don't have that satisfying food um, again think of things like the cost not very cost effective um, giving you know um, foods with lots of good vitamins and fatty acids in them so again think about if you change prisoners diets um, in, inside prison is that a good thing is that a bad thing is that something that they should consider Within the biological policies as well, you have things like genetic theories such as eugenics. If crime is inherited in our genes and if we identify these genes, should eugenics be practised? Um, so this links to things like sterilisation. So this is both of these are extremely um, controversial. They're very, very controversial. But if if a criminal has something that is genetic and that they might pass on to sibling and pass on to siblings, pass on to children, do you think that they should be sterilized? Should they be stopped from having children? Um, if somebody again is pregnant with criminal behaviour, should they be forced abortion? Please watch that clip. Um, it's one on YouTube that talks about this idea of the use of gene um, eugenics, etc. And again, think about the issues. Is this acceptable? Is this something that, again, this is very Nazi-esque. Um, the Nazis used a lot of sterilisation, certainly on disabilities. And obviously we're thinking about this in the lines of crime here. But is it is it ethical practice? 
On the other side, we've got the death penalty. This is the ultimate biological response to crime. State execution worldwide in 2016, 1,032 people executed around the globe. 2016, that's not that long ago at all that still that many people were executed on death row. Where do you stand on this issue? Where is your view as far as the death penalty? Um, and is this death penalty for... Who is it for? Where do you draw the line? Are you for, against or undecided? And obviously the way that this links in is if you are, if if you um, have state execution, if you have the death penalty, then obviously again, you can't reproduce and have more children. And again, you've got another clip there if you are interested. There's lots and lots on YouTube though, so um, do have a little look around, but obviously be careful because both of these, as I said, are very controversial areas and also quite distressing. Individualistic theories, and so moving on to the second section, we have psychoanalysis. Obviously this is Mr. Freud. Psychoanalysis is a talking therapy pioneered by Freud. It's aimed at uncovering unconscious problems using a range of techniques such as free association, hypnosis and regression. Now, this is something that is still used today, so that's a massive strength of it already. Free association is where you see the pictures, what do you see in the picture, to see how your mind works and what you associate with different things. Hypnosis is where you put under and ask questions to see if there's any deep-seated things. So um, remember Freud's iceberg, where you've got your unconscious, your subconscious mind and your conscious conscious mind uh, and the iceberg and obviously hypnosis goes into that subconscious things that's going underneath in the surface that you're not aware of and that could link to criminal behavior and then regression taking people back to childhood regressing back where did these problems stem from The idea rests on Freud's belief that all behaviour problems stem from repressed trauma from childhood development. So obviously Freud was extremely focused on childhood development. Now childhood development really does influence our adult behaviour um, and trauma for him is one of these massive ones. Obviously Freud talks about where phobias have to have an explanation. You know, you don't just suddenly get a phobia, for example. That phobia has a deep-rooted set reason why you are scared of something. Um, he also talks about how we identify with the same-sex parent, things like that. If that same-sex parent, uh, parent was a criminal, then does that also then lead to criminal behaviour? So these ideas rest on that the way you behave as an adult is caused by something in childhood and if you find that problem you can raise it to the surface and then you can deal with it often with criminals not knowing the cause of why they did something means that you can't always help it I know when uh, my class and I look at the James Bulger case one of the biggest clouds that hung over once the boys had been found that did this and obviously what happened in the case was just just one of the most horrific cases of all time um, but the two boys Venables and Thompson one of the big clouds was why did they actually do it and that was never found out we never found out why we never found out the cause of it and lots of things were blamed and so for freud he would look back at their childhood he'd look back at how they grew up and the influences they had people blame the media people blame the videos and the films that they watch people blame their upbringing maybe they just were like that but certainly individualistic policies can help try and get into the mind of criminals Sorry, my computer's gone on a go slow today. Oops. Um, if they can be made conscious, then they can be dealt with. We've also got Akon, who talks about, who uses psychoanalysis to treat young offenders in an institution, reasoning that their criminality could have been caused by underdevelopment of the superego, um, your conscience area, or maternal deprivation in childhood, so your ball be uh, stuff on ch childhood deprivation, being separated from your mother for a certain period of time, I think it's six months on and above as a, as a very young child. His approach involved creating a gentle, pleasant and positive environment for the young people. However, the effectiveness of psychoanalytic techniques are doubted today. Don't forget what we're talking about who's using these on criminals. So do you think that creating a gentle, pleasant and positive environment for a criminal would work? Come sit in here, we have nice music and incense, go and sit in the beanbag and tell me your problems. Do you really think a criminal would necessarily respond to that? Do you think a criminal would respond to um, talking about their childhood and really bringing out those on conscious things maybe if they got a reduced sentence they might do maybe not 
I don't know if this would would work um, with kind of you know he does it on young offenders, but would it work on a wider scale? Oops. Uh, so why might psychoanalysis be a difficult treatment to use successfully with criminals? So again, you need to have that evaluative tone in this. You have to think about um, what are the problems, what are the strengths. I mean, the strengths of this, as we'll find on the next slide, though, they, this is very cheap to do. Obviously, you have to have some trained doing it, but this doesn't cost anything. You're talking to the people. You're getting them to open up to you. The, tr the difficulty might be is that it only works if the person is responsive. Um, operant conditioning then. Um, operant conditioning looks at the works of Skinner and others. Things like token economies. So a token economy is based on the principle that behaviour that is rewarded is more likely to be repeated. So like Thorndike's law of, uh, law of effect. The tokens act as a positive reinforcer as they allow people to exchange for something that is desired. Primary reinforcer is the reward, the secondary reinforcer is the token. Punishment is the tokens taken away. So this is an idea that could be used within prisons and that's what you need to talk about, whether it's effective or not. Um, so when somebody does something good, you say, oh, well done, fantastic. They then get something for it. Here's here's some more food, here's an extra pillow, Um you get an extra get an extra half an hour on the phone, something like that. And so these are the ideas that, you know, people are reinforced positively for behaviours rather than emphasising the negative, rather than punishing um, and emphasising the bad things. Focus on the positive things. People then want them tokens of behaviour in that manner that you want them. Oops. Um, Hobbs and Holt in 1976 conducted a study which involved delinquent boys. They found that when they introduced a token economy system in three juvenile delinquent centres, there was a significant increase in their desired behaviours. Now, my class and I again discussed this one quite in depth. Um, and what we generally concluded was these things can work at first. Then people get bored of the tokens. Then people get bored of trying. People, it causes um, violence when you know people steal your tokens. Um, my students told me how it was used in one of their schools in secondary school, and how again students didn't really respond that well to it. It didn't really reduce the problems that they had. So at first, this can seem as a really exciting venture, but. Does it really work in the long term within prisons? Also a fair point to consider as well is um, what happens when the person is then released from prison and there's no reward for that behaviour, there's no tokens, they're not going to be put into an employment or into uh, housing or something like that and then they do, you know, take their bins out, oh, here's a token for you and that doesn't happen in the world outside of the prison. So evaluation of token economies, it can be administered in classrooms, hospital wards for mentally ill, anorexic patients, prisoners, youth homes. So this again is something that is used. You always see token economy everywhere. This idea that you're given something for something good. Teachers use it all the time. Stickers, sweets, biscuits. These are things even I'm guilty of it in the past. You give students things. Um, I'm more about praise. I praise students a lot. And it's always genuine praise as well because I always find what students say very interesting and, and really good contributions. But sometimes staff in classrooms take it the next step. You might have something where you get um, you collect stickers and then you get to go for a day out or something like that. So it's used in classrooms a lot. Hospital wards for mentally ill. Again, mentally ill might respond stronger to it because, again, it's something nice they're getting. They want more of it. Anorexic patients, if they eat something, Something, they might then be rewarded with being able to go home for a weekend or something like that. So this is used and you see it everywhere. Your parents will do it to you. Your teachers will do it to you. You might even do it to your friends. Um, you know, you might buy your friend a gift or something like that for driving you to college every day. Yeah, that's you reinforcing that behaviour to continue. So we all do it. We just aren't always aware of token economy. Um, it can produce immediate results and it's cheap to administer. You know, stickers don't cost anything. Some sweets don't cost anything. I'm talking about schools here, and but it depends what prisoners. Prisoners are very little, so it would still not cost that much within prisons. 
Um, however, there are min administrative problems. We again discussed this one about consistency training and abuse. So one teacher would give a student it for one thing and then another teacher wouldn't give it to them. Or, you know, you have to remember, oh, I gave them a token for that. So when someone else does it, oh, I have to give them a token for that. So like vicarious token economy. If you see someone else getting a token for it and then you do it, well, you need to get one as well. So, for example... If I had a student that never speaks in class and then spoke out of class, I might think, God, that's fantastic. Well done for saying a comment. You don't, you know, um, and for contributing. That's brilliant. Thanks very much. Here's a token. I then have another student that always contributes. And then they'll think, well, why did they get a token for speaking when they never speak? But I always contribute and I didn't get one. So consistency is a very, very hard problem for token economy. Um, you need to be trained how to do it and it can be abused. Client resistance to the programme, people just aren't interested. Does not work well with people with schizophrenia or psychopathy. Short term effects only until not to generalise beyond the institution itself. So it works in school, doesn't work out of school, works in prison, doesn't work outside of prison. And as I said, people are really on board at the beginning, but not so much in the long run. Individualistic uh, behaviourist intervention, so continuing on the individualistic line, we have classical conditioning. Classical conditioning, you have aversion therapy. Now, aversion therapy is extreme. This is not something that I believe goes on that much anymore, so not in this country. It may be used in other countries. It can be seen as fairly unethical as well. Aversion therapy is when you are, um, and it's associated with Eisnick, so I remember Eisnick's, um different types of personality scales uh, so this works quite well with certain personality scales but it's where you are forced to indulge in bad things uh, but something horrible happens to you while that's happening so for example um i'll just move through the slides because i can explain it through one of the clips i've got on here if it works oops um, so on that clip, that clip's on YouTube and it's about how aversion therapy was used on a homosexual man in the, I think it's about the 80s, um, who, who, he came out as homosexual and so he had aversion therapy done to him where he was made to feel, be physically sick, vomit uh, when looking at naughty male magazines and so he was indulging in something that was they saw as bad uh, the naughty magazines and then making him sick and obviously one of the most repulsive things that people feel is sickness that feeling of going to be sick actually being sick uh, you know being around someone else is being sick you know this is something that really uh, evolutionary triggers things within us and so every time looking at those images uh, um then wanting to be sick or vomiting associates the vomiting with the picture and you're a, that aversion therapy is you're putting them off the picture so they believed that they could make him not gay by aversion therapy and as the clip goes on it, it did not work um but aversion therapy was used in that way um the picture is from clockwork orange it's a cult film from the 80s you probably haven't seen it but he was a murderer and rapist and they used aversion therapy on him so it's quite an interesting film to see and again it's it's an 18 and it's it's very it's a very dark film so um not ever to everyone's taste So do you think this type of treatment could be effective? Would it work with different types of offenders, burglars, paedophiles, violent criminals? So do you think paedophiles, if you showed paedophiles lots of um, um, images and then made them sick or did something horrible to them? So think about something that you are hit. So for example, it might be needles. Every time you look at that picture, you then get a needle put into you. You would associate the fear of those needles with that picture, and then you would you'd be uh, you'd have aversion therapy away from that. For me, it's spiders, tarantulas. Ugh. Um, so for me, if I if I was doing something criminal, uh, you know, a criminal um, being, you know, it's not just pictures either. It could be videos. It, it can be anything. It's anything with that stimulus. Uh, and then people put spiders all over me. I would feel that revulsion to the spiders, potentially to the revulsion of whatever stimuli they're showing me or maybe not um 
cognitive treatments. Cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT, is a commonly used um, therapy. Some of you may even have cognitive therapy yourself. Some of you might have parents or friends that have uh, CBT. It focuses on the thought processes, how you process information, trying to change them in criminals. E.g. Think First program taught consequential thinking. What will be the consequence of my actions? Problem solving and perspective taking. Now, I have a lot of time for CBT. I think CBT can be a very can be very valuable for certain individuals. I also think it can really not work with certain individuals. And again, you need to discuss and consider that. Um, at the end of the day, saying to a, a serial killer or a paedophile, think about the consequence of your actions, you kind of think they were already aware of the consequences of their actions. So for a murderer, think how their parents would feel. Yeah, I, I, I don't know necessarily whether that would help, seeing the parents crying because you've, you've killed their daughter. Would that really stop them from doing the action? A paedophile, would it really stop them from doing the action? I mean, if they do the, what would be the consequences of my actions? Because I think they'd be fairly obvious and just ignored. Um, so that video um, goes over the use of cognitive uh, behavioural therapy and it gives you kind of the rundown list of what things are done. Um, do you think RIT, a, sorry, ART, aggressive replacement treatment, no, nope, I'll try that one again, aggressive replacement training could be effective in helping aggressive offenders deal with their aggression more positively and give reasons for your answer. So have a little look into aggressive replacement training, but it's very, very similar to above. You're changing the way that they think, the way that they change their reactions to certain situations through things like modelling, so seeing how other people respond and react to situations. Do you think it would work? Finally, the last section then is the sociological policy. So Merton strain theory as well as left realism, they're pretty much the same. They're very, very similar. So Merton strain theory, if you remember, is where you are straining for something beyond your means uh, um, and that constant strain, the wanting to be a part of the American dream, etc., makes you then turn to crime to fulfil that strain that you feel. Leads to efforts to reduce poverty and blocked opportunity and effort to reduce crime. So if you reduce the poverty therein, if you open the opportunities out to them, then there's less strain there because they can actually get the things they want. The government could invest in benefits and minimum wage. That clip there looks at somewhere in the Netherlands. I can't quite remember whereabouts it is and how they've given more um, more benefits to people to help them bring them out of poverty and things like that and they look at where the money goes to how the money is used how different individuals use the extra money they get um, etc so um, that's one that's worth a watch access to good schooling so education in prisons again educating them to be able to make more with their lives what do you think? What are the strengths and weaknesses of a policy of investing and in improving financial equality and education to reduce crime? So do you think if people were more educated, there'd be less crime? Do you think if there was more money in society, there'd be less crime? Or would, would the strength still be there? They just want more. So you give them some money, but they still want the car, they still want the house, so they still have that strain and therefore still turn to crime. So what do you think? Um, labelling theory, decriminalisation, so for example ca cannabis abuse so that few people are labelled, again if you stop the labelling then because once you're labelled you think well I've already got that label I might as well just commit more crime so if you reduce, if you take away that initial label maybe people wouldn't turn to crime so if you are a criminal because of cannabis abuse you won't be a criminal for other things but if you're already breaking the law you know, smoking cannabis, then you might think, oh, well, I might as well just break into that car or break that window. Again, though, are we making judgments? Maybe we'll just smoke cannabis. Doesn't mean that they're then going to turn to other crimes as well. So labelling, um, does it work? Does it not work? Removing that label, would it make people less likely to commit crime? Would it have any effect on it? Um, reintegrative shaming, this was Braithwaite, only labelling the crime as bad, not the person, any pros and cons of that. Now, 
we, I discussed this with my class this one and I'm not sure where I fall with the label and the crime is bad not the person um, when looking at certain crimes that we've looked at together um, certainly in your future topics when you start your unit three you'll have a look at a lot of case studies but think of things like the James Bulger case with the Thompsons and Thompson and Venables saying actually you murdering that toddler the crime's bad but you're not bad um, the men that 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 stab Stephen Lawrence the crime's bad, you aren't bad. Is that fair? Are, are these people bad? Is it just their actions that are bad? And um, This is often, I, and I told my class this, this is often used in teaching. Oh, it was the lesson that was bad, not the teacher. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't help the teacher. It doesn't make you feel any better. You're the one doing the lesson. So if the lesson's bad, it does reflect on you. Um, but again, that's my experience of this. You might see it as different. You might think actually something like this, just labelling the crime as bad, leaving the person unlabeled actually might work. Final section then, so this is sociological policies continued and this is now right realism. Now this is a massive section, right realism can be used in many, many ways within a sociological approach to policies. You have penal populism, now this is something that does happen. Um, major political parties compete with each other to be seen as the tough on crime. Penal populism is when political parties, political groups, conservative, your labour, etc., campaign pioneer support things that they think will make them popular within society hence the populism they become popular and one of the big focuses they do is on crime you elect me i'll help the crime in your area that sort of thing Professor David Wilson says it started as a result of the widespread public outrage at the murder of James Bulger in 1993. This fueled by the media created this tough approach as both a punishment and a deterrent. So that tough punishment then put other people off from doing the action. And because the government got behind it, enforced it, um, really made it, you know, tough on crime sort of approach, that then made them popular. Or certainly that's what they were trying for. E.g. Um, Tony Blair and the Labour government brought in ASBOs and curfews. So I remember growing up with ASBOs. ASBOs was when you did something a bit naughty and you got an ASBO. You don't have them anymore because they didn't really work. People like collected ASBOs like trophies. Oh, I've had 15 ASBOs. Um, so it didn't really work. But it was a way of putting people off. Oh, you've got an ASBO for that. Trying to put other people off from getting them didn't really work. Asbos were a bit like a warning. Um, it, it was recorded though, you became known to the police, but it was for low level things. A bit like playing your music past 11 o'clock at night, you'd get an Asbo. E.g. 1997 Conservative government brought in mandatory minimum sentences, e.g. three years for a third burglary conviction. So they brought in stricter, so we constantly flip flop between political parties and then they always change the pa they always change the policies of the previous party, they then bring their own in and we just flop from policy to policy every new time we elect somebody in. Maybe that's a good thing, I don't know. Um, but yeah, 1997 when the Conservative government came in, they then made it so that if you committed a crime, you got at least three years. This was then to try and put people off with the, oh, I'm only going to get six months, so it's worth it approach. Um, yeah, again, this I don't think this stood because keeping people in prison for three years, very expensive, not enough space, just didn't work. Issues. It tends to be used for political reasons. What are the issues with this? The prison population tends to increase. Again, what are the issues? It tends to be influenced by victims' movements. And again, any issues with these? Think about the protests that have gone on, the George Floyd situation. What issues are there with victim movements? Is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? So are there any issues with this? And it tends to be heavily influenced by media involvement and portrayals of offenders. So, again, what are the issues here? You need to remember as well that, that papers are very politically driven. So papers are can be very biased in the language that they use, as we found out last in, in Unit 1, um, the way that the media represents different things. So 
you're very influenced by media that's around you. Um, and so again, what effects might this have on penal populism? Prison, uh, when we did it as a class, we looked just at the pros and cons of prisons. Uh, we, we watched a documentary and then we uh, wrote a view on whether prisons were effective. For, for each of these, we did a Padlet. So each of these the students did a research, a bit of their own research on them because they're actually really, really interesting. They're really interesting um, policies. Zero tolerance. A zero tolerance policy is one which imposes a punishment for every infraction of a stated rule. Zero tolerance policies forbid people in positions of authority from exercising discretion or changing punishments to fit the circumstances um, subjectively. They are required to impose a predetermined punishment regardless of individual culpability, extenuating circumstances or history. What that means simply is zero tolerance means I don't want to hear your reasons why, I don't want to hear your background story, I don't want to hear your stop story, something's happened, you're going to prison. That's it. Cut and dry, black and white. So, for example, um, somebody's been murdered, there's a dead body, so there's been a dead body and a crime has been committed. It would not matter whether it was an abused wife that defended herself. No, nope, still dead, you're getting done for murder. Whether it was... Um, you know, another situation that you'd go, you'd think actually, you know, an accident, if it was a complete accident, you pushed somebody, they fell over, they died, no, they're still dead at your hands, you're a murderer. So zero tolerance means nothing at all is accepted, nothing is listened to, a crime has been committed and therefore you are going to get punished according to that crime. Um, the words down there, culpability, so it doesn't matter, so culpability means how guilty are you of that act. So this is very much saying it doesn't matter what the murder is, you've, you've got a dead person. Um, extenuating circumstances, the things that are happening in your life, this could also, extenuating circumstances could also class as mental illness. Nope, there's still somebody that's dead, I'm going to punish you the same. Um, or history, so again, if something in their history has caused them to do it, nope, again, they're dealt with all the same. Zero tolerance, not interested in stories, no subjectivity, no judges' own discretion, none of that. Um, so, for example, and I get, uh, you know, we, dis we discussed this as a class and I talked about the idea that our college is not a zero tolerance college. Um, so if you got called up to see your principal because um, you've done something you shouldn't have done and you might say, well, actually, it's because I've, I've had to leave home. Um, I'm now living on my friend's sofa. Um, I, I, I don't know how to get to college because I have no money. Somebody that has zero tolerance would say, no. Nope, You've still done this so many times, you're there for, you're expelled, you're excluded, you're suspended, you're out. Uh, whereas, as I said, we don't take a zero tolerance attitude. So we'd listen to the situation, what can we do to help? Uh, um, and we would put things in place to support in the hopes that it then doesn't continue or happen again. So it's very extreme is zero tolerance. Last section then, zero tolerance um, continued. Is it effective? The crime fell after it was introduced in New York in 1990s, but there might have been other factors at play, such as crime fell in other US states at the same time that had not adopted uh, ZTP. So they did use it in New York. Whether it was because of that, we don't know. Um, zero tolerance policy can lead to targeted of ethnic minorities due to police racism and confrontation due to military style policing. So again, the zero tolerance, you might have your own um, racial prejudices. You might just think you're a youth, you're going to do something bad. You're this, you're going to do something bad. So you've already judged them. And then with the zero tolerance, you know, I'm not going to listen to the, your reasons. I'm not going to listen to you. Can be very, very extreme. Uh, ZTP doesn't tackle the underlying structural cause of crime like inequality. It can also neglect crimes of the powerful and influential such as white collar and state crime. So what happens if you are um, middle class, well spoken, well educated, yet you commit fraud? Is that going to be as dealt with as bad as other things? Um, and it also doesn't tackle the reason why people do it in the first place, which is what left realism looks at a bit more or certainly talk therapy does, so the individualist approaches definitely look at trying to, the Freud tries to look at why people behave in that way. Is CCTV effective? 
It only works if criminals believe they are being watched. Jill and Lovedale found very few criminals were deterred by it and Norris found CCTV has very little effect except to displace crime to where somewhere else. So there's a camera up there. I'm just going to go over there and do it. So it didn't deter them, it just moved them. Sometimes it is successful, such as identifying the right-wing terrorist David Copeland, who had later convicted of nail bomb attacks in London in 1999, where he targeted black, Bengali and LGBT communities. Three people were killed, including a pregnant woman. Also, it helped ID the boys who kidnapped James Bulger. Norris and Armstrong found CCTV operators use racist stereotypes when surveying, so looking for certain groups of people. And some argue that CCTV leads to surveillance creep, where it's where it's installed uh, um, for one purpose but gets used for another. So, for example, CCTV installed in response to an IRA bombing campaign in London didn't identify a bomber, but used to identify untaxed vehicles. So the CCTV, and this is we look at CCTV when you come to Unit Three, so your next big unit. We look at CCTV in crimes, and again, it can lead to things like stalking people. Um, basically, it's like a peeping tom of technology, isn't it? Finally, does restorative justice work? Yes, as it can give the victim a voice in the criminal justice system. So um, this is the idea of making them aware of what they've done. Can make offenders accountable and face up to the effects of their actions. So this is the think about what, what your actions will do. Think of the effects it will have. So it can make them accountable and it can make them face up to the effects of their actions. So things like vandalism, you vandalise something or burgle somebody, you know, let them meet that person, let them see the effects that it's had. The Prison Fellowship in 2017 website says that restorative justice has been shown to reduce PTSD in victims and sometimes motivate offenders to stop their crimes. Sometimes motivate them. Um, but it does help the person suffering to get things off their chest. The Ministry of Justice report in 2001 found that most victims will choose to participate when it's offered. 85% of victims were satisfied with the process and it reduced re-offence rates by 14% and for every £1 spent on it, it saves the criminal justice system £8 from having to, um, you know, convict them again for another crime. So it saves them money in the long run by them not re-offending. So there is some um, good statistics there. 14% isn't much, but it's better than nothing. So you need to, again, as I've said, be able to evaluate these different sections. You need to know your biological individuals and your sociological policies that go within them. You need to be able to read the, the short stories or accounts in your summer exam to see which ones of these fit better and why. Fabulous. Hopefully you found that useful everyone. If you've got any comments or questions, please, please feel free to um, comment underneath um, and don't forget to subscribe as well. This will keep you up to date with all my latest videos so you never miss out. Um, thanks very much everybody. Bye for now.